You're watching The Wellness Hour, the leader in medical news and information. I'm Randy Alvarez. Today's topic, new treatment options for men that have been diagnosed with prostate cancer. What you need to know. With us, we have an expert on the topic, Dr. Bands. Dr. Bands, welcome to the program. Thank you, Randy. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, this is a big topic. Now, for people that don't know your center, 21st Century Oncology, Who's the typical patient and what is your role with the center? Well, 21st Century Oncology is an international cancer company and I have the opportunity to work with them as an exclusive prostate cancer specialist. I consult newly diagnosed prostate cancer patients and offer options and opinions as to what their best course is. You're the person, by the way, you don't do the surgical procedure, you don't do the uh, radiation, you kind of facilitate What's the best treatment for them? Well, I'm a urologist who did the surgical procedure okay. for over 30 years. And in the past year, 21st Century Oncology has given me the opportunity and designated me as their prostate cancer director for Arizona at this point. And in so doing, it was a difficult decision, but I decided to be an unbiased consultant. I would stop operating. I would give unbiased opinions as to what the best treatment options would be for a patient. Who is the typical uh, patient these days? Are they getting younger and younger, the men? Uh, or are they older and older? Uh, well, prostate under- cancer is a unique disease. I've treated uh, people as, as young as 36. And of course, I treat a lot of elderly patients. But uh, the statistics on prostate cancer are quite alarming to people if they don't know. Uh, actually, 30% of 50-year-old patients actually have microscopic prostate cancer. And if you get to be 60 years old, you got about a 50 or 60% chance of having microscopic, what we call occult prostate cancer. So it's out there. The question is, if people are diagnosed at various ages, um, they would then come to me for an opinion as to what's the best option for them. So what are the symptoms uh, when you have prostate cancer? Well, typically there are no symptoms with early prostate cancer, and that's one of the dilemmas. Uh, You can have early prostate cancer and have absolutely no symptoms. As the disease progresses, if it does, there can be symptoms. Those might include obstructive urinary symptoms, such as difficulty urinating, slower stream, getting up at night. Uh, There may be blood in the urine or blood in the semen. Um, There may be pain associated with it. But the hooker in all this is that these symptoms are not unique to cancer. So people with benign prostatic uh, abnormalities, uh, people with BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, or prostatitis, they may have these same symptoms. And the dilemma here is sorting that out, trying to figure out what the symptoms mean to the individual patient. Okay, now PSA, I guess in years past, was the gold standard look at the PSA, measure the PSA, and now I, I guess it's looked at as maybe not. Is that, is that, is that right? Because well, when we talked on the phone, you think the PSA needs to be checked. I do. Uh, PSA is a protein that's produced by prostate, can- by prostate cells, and it's produced by benign and malignant cells. Back in the early 1980s when PSA was discovered, We learn that the higher the PSA in a man's blood, the higher the risk of having prostate cancer. The uh, U.S. Preventive Task Force has actually recently downgraded PSA and recommended that primary care physicians and other healthcare providers not use PSA for screening for prostate cancer. You think that's wrong? I think it's wrong. I think, uh, you know, when you look back to the 1980s, what we had was a situation where roughly two-thirds of men who were diagnosed with prostate cancer were diagnosed too late. They had advanced disease, which was at that point in time incurable, and today would be incurable as well. Um, We dropped that statistic down to about 15 to 20 percent of men presenting with advanced disease because we were picking up people with earlier prostate cancer. PSA still is a very strong tool to use wisely in looking at patients and risk stratifying them for their levels of risk for having prostate cancer. So over 50, you think somebody should have their prostate looked at or PSA looked at? Well, the interesting statistic, the best statistics we have at this point in time is that the PSA at age 40 to 45 is the best predictor that we know of today whether or not someone will eventually develop prostate cancer. 
The reason for that is probably that at that age, the prostate has not started to grow benignly, which we call BPH, and therefore PSA is more significant when the prostate is smaller. So I actually am a believer that it would be helpful to know what a person's PSA was at age 40 to 45, and then risk stratify them. Now in addition to PSA, which gets a lot of press, people need to be examined for prostate cancer, and that's called the digital rectal examination called DRE. And unfortunately, a lot of primary care providers at this point in time are being told by their specialty boards, number one, don't draw PSAs for screening because it's not helpful and we're picking up too many people with low risk disease. And number two, don't do examinations, don't do DREs. And I think that's a huge mistake. I think we're gonna And that's see going on. That's going on today. In fact, we think that this year alone, because of the US Preventive Task Force recommendation, we think there's probably gonna be a decline in prostate cancer diagnoses in the tune of about 30%. So without a PSA, and, and just so I'm picking up on the fact, without a PSA, people are going to present at later stages of prostate cancer. That's if you don't we, get a PSA, is that what is well, going on? Well, I, I think if you're not screened for prostate cancer, if you don't get a PSA and yeah. you don't get an examination, then you're going back to pre-PSA era and we're waiting gonna, for blood in the urine, waiting for waiting till a point where it's too late for a lot of men. Okay, so right. your I mean your message, I guess, is get a PSA. My message is over uh, fifty, might as well. My message is get a PSA. All right. Have a prostate examination, a DRE, and if men are not satisfied in speaking with their providers that these things are being done and they wish to pursue it more extensively then I think they should go to a urologist and have those things checked. So beyond PSA, are there other tests? Yes, yeah. there are new, new blood tests. One's called the Prostate Health Index, it's called PHI, and it's a score, it incorporates PSA and some other proteins in the blood that are related to PSA, and it actually gives the, the man a percentage risk of having cancer or a positive biopsy. It's not perfect either, because the percentage risk ranges from about 11% to about 52%. We wish we could have zero to 100%. But it is more specific for picking up prostate cancers. Uh, there's also a blood test that's, that's now out called the 4K score. K is the letter K, and K stands for calicrin. That's the family of proteins that PSA is in. The 4K score, if it pans out, will be a big advantage in people because it predicts intermediate or high-grade prostate cancer and actually gives you the percentage risk of having it. So these newer blood tests, I think, will be beneficial in terms of, number one, diagnosing people earlier, but number two, hopefully, not over-diagnosing or not putting men through unnecessary prostate biopsies. Okay, is that a lot of that going on? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. Now, how does somebody get to see you, a specialist? Because there's very few. I guess just very few in Arizona that this is all they do. Do they need a referral from their primary care physician? Uh, and because you, you only deal with people that they've already been diagnosed. They've been given a diagnosis, right? Right. So and this is a scary time. So how did they get to see you? Well, I have an existing practice of literally thousands of patients, many of whom have had prostate cancer. So I continue to care for them, continue to follow them and make recommendations to them. But anyone can see me. I mean, you just make an appointment. They don't need a referral specifically. Uh, I would say about half of my patients are word of mouth from other patients. So if somebody has prostate cancer, they go to you. How do you determine treatment? What's best for them? Radiation, surgery, whatever. Yeah, so you have to individualize it. You have to look at the patient's disease. You have to look at what grade of cancer they have. Is it an aggressive cancer? Is it a slow-growing cancer that's possibly not gonna harm them. Um, and then you have to look at risk factors. Do they have a family history? Um, and then you actually can utilize new tests that are out on the genomic side or the genetic side that actually look at their specific cancer and try to determine how aggressive that malignancy is. So you put all of these things together. You look at the age, the grade of the cancer, what we call the stage, how advanced it is, and you come up with options, 
And those options are varied and they range anywhere from no treatment advised, which we currently call active surveillance, uh, used to be called watchful waiting, uh, all the way to active treatment, which might involve removal of the prostate, which is surgery, radiation therapy, freezing the prostate, uh, which is called cryotherapy, uh, and there's also a treatment called high-intensity focused ultrasound. And then we're short on time, so let's start with treatment options. Okay, who should just be observed or followed? They've been diagnosed. Who okay. should get surgery and who should get uh, radiation? Okay, well, a lot of people today should just be followed with active surveillance. People with very low-risk disease, low-grade cancers, things that are probably not gonna impact their lifespan, um, and it's estimated today that at least 50% and maybe up to 60 or 70% of people diagnosed with prostate cancer may fit into that category. Okay. Um, the people who have more aggressive cancers or the younger patients that have more to lose if things progress, then would be looking towards surgery to remove the prostate or other forms of treatment such as radiation or freezing or Let me ask you this question. Okay. As, because you're a consultant, have you ever had patients, or how common is it that you have patients that have been told you need surgery or you need radiation, and your, your uh, opinion is we should probably just watch it? That is becoming more and more common. Uh, just in the past few weeks, I've seen three or four people who have been diagnosed, told to be treated quickly. With what? Surgery with, or radiation? In this case, it was surgery in these three or four patients, and my advice was let's back off, let's not rush to treatment option. It may be the right thing for you, but first let's consider the options, let's talk about the risks and side effects of treatments, and let's perhaps use some of the new biomarkers, the genomic studies, to try to tell us whether or not you're at risk with this disease. So do you have a lot of those under your belt? Quite a few. Over the years, I mean, so every single week, somebody that has been told you need surgical treatment or radiation, you're saying, let's just watch it. Uh, there's a lot of patients like that. At least that. once a week. Oh, for sure. Like a lot, yeah. every week. Yeah. What's good to know. Definitely. Interesting. Okay, so when should somebody then, uh, you, you briefly talked about when should it be watched. Let's talk about surgery and then radiation. Pros and cons of both. Okay, well, I mean, there are risks to both. Uh, the surgical side has the risk of undergoing surgery, being under anesthesia, being in a hospital. Uh, it is a major operation, even though it's l less major than it used to be years ago. Um, so there are risks of surgery. There are risks of what we call collateral damage in removing the prostate. When we remove the prostate, there are risks of urinary incontinence or difficulty controlling urine. There are sexual side effects, including erectile dysfunction. And uh, men need to know that sexually they change after a prostatectomy. There's no longer any semen. They no longer ejaculate. And they may have erectile dysfunction and difficulty getting erections if the surgery impacts them in that way. Current techniques, fortunately for a lot of men, are such that you can do nerve sparing surgery, preserve erectile function, but even with that, it may take months, even several years to regain function. Does everyone get uh, urinary incontinence at the not, beginning during not, the healing process? Yeah, so not everyone gets that. Okay. About 50% of people have good continence or good control right after surgery when their catheter is removed about a week later. But about 50% need to wear pads or protection and have some stress incontinence. By one year, the statistics are that about two or 3% of men will have continued need for protection from some stress incontinence. So it's not a huge long-term risk, but it's always in someone's mind, you know, am I gonna be that one or 2% yeah, that, that yeah. needs something long-term? So radiation. Radiation does not have the immediate sexual side effects, typically, um, and it does not have the urinary incontinence problems initially. However, long-term with radiation, because the prostate is so close to the rectum and the bladder, there can be some side effects related to rectal problems or bladder problems. Um, a low percentage? Uh, it's very low. Okay. It's very low. And, and with current techniques, it's probably well less than 5%. But these things need to be discussed with the patient. 
In addition to that, even though patients don't have erectile dysfunction early on, they may develop that as years go on as the effects of the radiation accumulate over time. So surgery or radiation, one's not better than the other. It just depends on the type of, or the stage of the cancer? Well, the statistics show that most studies, when you compare surgery to radiation for the average prostate cancer, not the outliers with the real aggressive ones or the, or the indolent ones, um, the 15-year survival data is roughly comparable with radiation or surgery. And that's an important factor, you know, when you get into someone's 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, do they want to go through an operation with some of those side effects or would they rather go with, with the radiation? Um, so I think radiation is an excellent form of treatment for prostate cancer. The downside is that if you irradiate a very young patient and the prostate cancer comes back in years or decades to follow, then it becomes more difficult to treat, particularly surgically. So there are, there are some problems with what we call salvage radical surgery. So for surgery. younger people, radiation, you have to be careful. I think you have to be careful. Younger meaning in their 40s. I think you have to be careful in, in the 40s and 50s. However, I've got many patients in their 40s and 50s who have chosen radiation and are doing very well, but they need to be well informed as to what the potential long-term risks of both okay. treatment options might be. Now, you know, and I know when you agreed to this interview, we wanted to stay positive. And I don't certainly, I don't want to come off like we're trying to attack one thing or another, but the way it works, it seems like whoever you go to, for, if you go to the surgeon and that if they don't do radiation, in their mind, maybe they are more likely to recommend surgery, or if you go to the person that just does radiation. That happens, is that correct? Well, unfortunately it does. So and it's happening every single day, all of the time, depending on who you refer to. Yes, and you know, what it depends on, you know, when you look at surveys of radiation oncologists versus surgeons, you know, the statistics are a little bit alarming. Up to 80 or 90% of surgeons recommend surgery up to 80 to 90% of radiation oncologists recommend radiation. However, you know, it kind of flavors the situation in a, in a negative way because both modalities treat prostate cancer very successfully for the most part. Okay. And, you know, in medicine, we tend to recommend what we do best yes. and what we believe in. And so, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, as biased as it seems, I don't believe in terms a of the conspiracy statistics. going on or anything right. like that. Right. I mean, they're doing what they think is best for the patient. So why not go to a consultant like you that could say, "Hey, I do both." Yeah. Even though you're literally not doing both, you're referring to both. Well, the first right? thing people should know is they don't have to rush into a decision. For most people, they can take weeks, months, sometimes even years to make a decision, depending on what their disease process is. So they've got time. And uh, I, I would like them to l read, to talk to various consultants, and to talk to different specialists before they make a decision. Uh, a lot of times they want to do that, and sometimes they don't. So you're the second opinion guy, right? I, I, I value being a second opinion guy, yes. But people could see you first. Absolutely. Obviously. Well, after the diagnosis, correct. Primary care physicians will watch this show. What's your message to them about PSA, even though they've been advised to not recommend it? Yeah. Well, my message is that they should talk to their male patients and let them know that uh, their society does not necessarily think that PSA screening is beneficial to them. And they should discuss with their patients the option of whether or not they want to be screened. And they should offer their patients the option of seeing a specialist, a urologist, who can do that in a very expertise manner um, and let the patient be comfortable with whatever they decide. But the patient needs to be informed that these options are open even though the government has downgraded PSA screening. But a lot of people, do a lot of people die from, from uh Prostate cancer, what are the numbers? Okay, so 30,000 American men will die of prostate cancer this year, it's estimated. That's the second leading cause of cancer death in men behind lung cancer. So a lot of people die of prostate cancer. But to put it in a, in a more positive perspective, 
230,000 men are diagnosed annually. So while about one in six American men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime, one in 36 American men die of it. So it's not a fatal disease for the vast majority of people. We want to pick up the people in that 30,000 before they become that statistic. But well, with the PSA going away, so to speak, people are getting, you know, picked up their cancer later, more advanced. That's so that's, it makes sense if you're 50 plus uh, to go in and you know maybe request a physical exam and request a PSA, and maybe if it's elevated, do it again in another month when it uh, when you're relaxed or right. whatever. It, I mean, logically, it makes sense. Well, I should add it's that covered the, by insurance. Why yeah. not? Well, why not is the big question because uh, the concern with the U.S. Preventive Task Force is that there are a lot of biopsies that are done in this country because of elevated PSAs. There's risk to biopsies. There's a one or 2% chance of sepsis or severe life-threatening infection. There are bleeding risks. So it, it, it's a mixed bag. I mean, we don't wanna over-diagnose and put people through too many invasive procedures if they don't need them. But if you're watching it, you know, and it's up, and then you watch it six months later, it's up, and then a year later, it's up, now it's time to probably take a look at it, right? Like well, you did in your case, in your own yeah, personal well, case. Well, I think, yeah, I think you have to see the expert. I think you have to see the urologist and let them discuss with you what they think your best option is at that point. Okay, good. Yeah. Also, for, for uh, final message to the, the person that has been told, they've never had a second opinion, but they've been told you need surgery. They could see, you say that they need a second opinion. Maybe they don't need surgery. And it happens every week in your office that, People have been told they need surgery, and you say, maybe not. Let's watch it, right? Correct. And you have followed them for years, and they're fine. Well, there are a lot of people I've followed for years with what we call active surveillance today. Um, but I think people need to know that there are risks in anything we choose in life. Yeah, yeah. You know, active surveillance is not without some risk that the disease might progress and be caught too late. But I think you have to put the whole picture together. I think you have to inform patients what their options are, what their potential risks are on both sides. Um, and people are smart in general. They wanna make the right decision for themselves. There are some men who can live with that diagnosis knowing that it may not harm them and they're comfortable with that. There are other men where you give them a diagnosis of cancer and the first thing they wanna do is just treat it, get rid of it, okay. whether it's radiation or surgery. And those people are much more comfortable long-term having treated it. So it really depends a lot on the individual So you're well. a doctor. They're in your office. We are really rushed on time here, about a minute left. But they're in your office, and they must say, doctor, what would you do if it was you? Do they ever say that? All, almost always. They either say that or uh, what would you recommend to your brother or your father or this thing. And uh, I give them my opinion. You know, I do mention, though, that I may be a little biased since I chose to be treated at mm -hmm. a relatively young age. But uh, as far as being biased in terms of what their treatment options are at this point in time, that's history and that's what the beauty of my consulting role is at this point. And you've been doing this 30 years plus. Right. So you've seen a lot of kind of hardship cases but also a lot of positive cases. So early detection, of course, beats everything, right? Yeah. Well, the beauty of urology and prostate cancer is that there are a lot of positive outcomes. And the vast majority of people do well with prostate cancer. The vast majority, if they elect treatment, are cured. And that Good. makes my life happy. I want to thank you for coming to the show. Great stuff. We're out of time. Is there anything we missed in 30 well, seconds here? What well, haven't we talked about? Well, we missed some of the newer imaging studies, which are called multiparametric MRI scans, which are very important uh, in imaging prostate cancer. So that's something we didn't touch, but people need to be aware of that option, as well as the option of what's called focal therapy, where instead of treating the whole gland with radiation or with surgery, there's new modalities where we treat only the cancer, whether that's freezing or heating or focal radiation. So these are things we didn't cover, but they're out there and they're uh, for our next show. And you're probably. one of the few guys in the state that all you do is prostate cancer. That's correct. Is that right? That's right. All right, thanks again for coming to the Thank show. You. Great thanks, stuff. Thanks, Randy. You've been watching The Wellness Hour. I'm Randy Alvarez for now. I wish you could help. Thanks for watching The Wellness Hour, the leader in medical news with your host, Randy Alvarez, the authority on health issues.